Hello, this is Kai Rassus, and in this Blood Death Knight analysis video, we are going to talk about defensive cooldown management. This includes talking about their individual mechanics, how to decide when to use these cooldowns, and how to prioritize which defensive cooldowns we should use. While this video is presented from a Blood Death Knight perspective, some portions are applicable to other tank specializations. Our first defensive cooldown is Vampiric Blood, which is stronger than it may first appear. The increased healing affects both our healing as well as incoming healing from other players. And, since Blood Death Knights can currently heal around 70-80% to 80 of the damage they take, buffing this 70-80% to 80 value by 35% means that we need little to no healer attention while this cooldown is active. It is worth noting that our current and maximum health increases by 30% the instant we activate Vampiric Blood. So, if we used Vampiric Blood when our current health was at 5%, our current health percentage will increase to 27% because of Vampiric Blood. However, as soon as Vampiric Blood expires, we will lose health equal to the amount that Vampiric Blood initially added. So, if you are at or below 23% current health when Vampiric Blood expires, your health will instantly drop to one hit point. Because the health you gain from Vampiric Blood is additive, and because it increases healing received instead of reducing incoming damage, Vampiric Blood is a defensive cooldown that can be used reactively after we have taken a large amount of damage, without missing out on its benefits. Most other defensive cooldowns need to be active before we take a large amount of damage if we want to mitigate it. So, if you know a tank buster mechanic is about to hit you, that will not one-shot you, and that you have a chance to parry, you can wait to see if it actually hits you first before using Vampiric Blood. Another very powerful Blood Death Knight defensive cooldown is Dancing Rune Weapon. Because it increases parry chance, its effectiveness is limited to melee attacks and even though it will mitigate a large percentage of incoming melee attacks, it is not the most reliable defensive cooldown, particularly when you are dealing with a hard-hitting single-target mob. And this is just due to the randomness of parry. Sometimes it won't mitigate any attacks at all, and sometimes it can mitigate more than its share, just depending on luck. In any case, Dancing Rune Weapon also functions as an offensive cooldown. Since the Dancing Rune Weapon amplifies the damage of most of our abilities by 33%, and all threat that the Dancing Rune Weapon generates gets added to our own personal threat. This gives Dancing Rune Weapon extra value when used at the start of pulls. Furthermore, all Heart Strikes performed while Dancing Rune Weapon is active will generate 5 additional runic power, and all Mara Rens used during Dancing Rune Weapon will generate 3 additional Bone Shield stacks. This gives it extra value when used while our runic power or bone shield stacks are low. Finally, Dancing Rune Weapon is our only baseline defensive cooldown that is on the global cooldown, which means that we won't be able to cast it while performing other actions, and it is more difficult to activate it at precise timings. Icebound Fortitude and Lichborn with the Hardened Bones Conduit are a lot more straightforward. They are simple damage reduction buffs, though each have the added benefit of being able to break or immune certain types of crowd control. The crowd control benefit does not have too many uses in PvE settings, but there are very specific situations where the benefit is useful, such as immuning stuns from stealth mobs in dungeons. Anti-Magic Shell provides a magic absorb shield that also generates runic power based on the damage absorbed. Additionally, the anti-magic shell buff can immune the application of most magic debuffs while active. However, it will not remove magic debuffs that are already active on you before you activate it anti-magic shell. Anti-magic zone is also limited to only magic damage, though it comes in the form of a ground-based effect that also works on our allies. It absorbs a percentage of incoming magic damage instead of just reducing it, so all reduced damage still counts towards Death Strike healing and other mechanics that are based on the amount of damage that you take. There is also a cap on the Magic Absorb based on our health total. 
but this almost never comes into play for Blood Death Knights, since we have large health pools by default. However, if you are in a situation where the size of the absorb cap is an issue, you have the option of using Vampiric Blood before Anti-Magic Zone to increase the absorb cap by 30%. Rune Tap looks like a simple defensive reduction cooldown at face value, but it is complicated by the fact that it costs a rune. This is a rune that you could have instead used on Heart Strike, which would have generated anywhere from 5 to 20 more runic power than Rune Tap will. This often means that using Rune Tap is an overall mitigation loss, in addition to being a damage loss. As such, it is usually the defensive cooldown of last resort that you will only be using if the short-term damage reduction is needed to survive burst damage. Outside of that, there are a few very specific ways that you can game its use to make it a more valuable ability. 1. You can use Rune Tap when you are affected by a strong healing reduction effect and this can turn it into a mitigation gain, because healing reduction effects reduce the mitigation value of the lost runic power generation. 2. Using runic power during boss intermissions or between pulls in Mythic Plus can give us free runic power, because we may have nothing else to use our rune regeneration on at these times. 3. You can use rune tap when you are starting a pull with full runes and no other defensive cooldowns available, and this can greatly reduce or remove the cost of rune tap because it helps us to maximize our rune regeneration faster. And four, using rune tap when we have the increased rune regeneration effect from Crimson Rune Weapon active can greatly reduce or remove the cost of rune tap because we are generating resources faster than we can spend them with this buff active. Swarming Mist is the first of two Covenant-specific defensive cooldowns, and it is a strange one because it does a little bit of everything. Its main traditional defensive benefit is the 10% dodge that it gives you, which is not too strong and, like the parry that we gain from Dancing Rune Weapon, it is inconsistent. However, what makes Swarming Mist into a strong ability is the amount of runic power it generates against multiple targets. If you can keep up with spending the runic power that is being generated, this ability practically makes you immortal while it is active in pulls with multiple targets. Because of its high runic power generation potential, it is especially powerful when used at low levels of runic power to refill your runic power pool. Because Swarming Mist is not strictly a defensive cooldown, it is on the global cooldown like Dancing Rune Weapon. Fleshcraft is the second of two Covenant-specific defensive cooldowns. Its effect is a standard damage reduction while active, and it also creates a lingering absorb shield over its duration. But you must channel the ability for its duration to gain full damage reduction and shield effects. We are able to dodge and parry while channeling this ability, so it is perfectly fine to use this while actively tanking enemies even if it's a little clunky to stand still and channel an ability for three seconds. However, because of the lingering absorb shield effect, you can also choose to use this ability when you are not actively tanking instead, just for the generated shield. While this video is not focused on trinket analysis, it is important to note that on-use defensive trinkets have a variety of effects that can sometimes be managed as defensive cooldowns. A good example of this in patch 9.1 is the Shard of Anahilt's Aegis, which can significantly reduce incoming damage against multiple targets while it is active. Now that we have looked at our individual defensive cooldowns, we will talk about how we want to be using these defensive cooldowns. First things first, if you are not sure how you should be timing your cooldowns or when you should be holding on to them, it is better to just use them. If you are never using these abilities at all, they will not be giving you any value. And if you are being overly conservative with their timing, you are potentially losing more value from lost uses of these abilities than you are gaining with higher value uses. Only save cooldowns for specific timings if you are confident it is the right choice. Rune Tap is a big exception to this advice. In fact, you probably should not be using Rune Tap at all unless you are confident that you are in a situation where it is worth using. Next, 
Anytime you stack cooldowns, you are lowering the value of your cooldowns since they reduce damage multiplicatively. For example, if you had two separate cooldowns that reduced incoming damage by 50% when they are active separately, and you decide to use them both at the same time, the first cooldown is reducing 50% of the original damage, while the second cooldown is only reducing 25% of the original damage. If both of these cooldowns were used apart, the second cooldown used would be twice as effective as it is when they're used together. On rare occasions, you may need to stack cooldowns in order to survive very specific raid mechanics or gigantic trash pulls that are planned ahead of time. But these situations are rare and stacking cooldowns should not be your default behavior. Additionally, we want to make sure that we are using cooldowns when we are actually going to be taking a significant amount of damage. So there are a few things to keep in mind. For example, raid and dungeon bosses may stop attacking you for periods of time to perform other mechanics, and you would ideally not want to have defensive cooldowns rolling while nothing is happening to you. An example of this is the last boss of Necrotic Wake, who periodically stops attacking you to channel Comet Storm, so you would not want to have defensive cooldowns running when Comet Storm is being cast. In other situations, enemies may have hard-hitting tank buster mechanics, where it is especially valuable to have a defensive cooldown active. These abilities are very common on both raid and dungeon bosses, such as Reaping Scythe on the last boss of Theater of Pain, and we would like our defensives to overlap with these abilities whenever possible. Specifically in raid, you also want to line up your defensive cooldowns for when you are actually tanking the boss, otherwise you could be wasting a portion of the cooldown, so be mindful of tank swap timings. In Mythic Plus specifically, the same is true if someone in your group is using crowd control abilities on trash, such as AoE stuns or treants, where all enemies will stop attacking you for a period of time. These abilities indirectly do the same thing as defensive cooldowns, so you do not want to stack your cooldowns with their effects. Because of this, it is beneficial to coordinate with your group so you are not overlapping these abilities. Also in Mythic Plus, it is important to keep in mind when an encounter is about to end, or when specific enemies are about to die in a large trash pull. We would ideally want to use our defensive cooldowns while most enemies in a pack are still alive, since this is when they will be doing the most damage to you, and we ideally want the full duration of the defensive cooldown to be used before the pull is over. Otherwise, we may not be gaining full value out of our defensive cooldowns, and it may be worth waiting until the next pull begins to use them. The last consideration on defensive cooldown timings is to keep in mind the effect defensive cooldowns have on our runic power pool. Since our defensive cooldowns are increasing our mitigation, we will not need to use as much runic power to sustain ourselves. The one exception to this is rune tap, which lowers our runic power generation. One strategy that is used in particularly dangerous content is to use your runic power pool to coast between defensive cooldowns, which can allow you to sustain yourself for much longer periods of time when tanking a pack compared to using all of your defensive cooldowns immediately after the last one expires. However, if you are not being pressured by the content you are doing, getting too used to this strategy can cause you to underutilize your defensive cooldowns. Now, that we have looked at timing and usage considerations, we will talk about how we want to be choosing between our different defensive cooldowns. The first rule of thumb is to prioritize your stronger defensive cooldowns, since this will allow you to get higher usage out of the cooldowns that are more impactful. When I am talking about stronger defensive cooldowns, I am referring to how effective they are at reducing damage while they are active. So, if 100% of your incoming damage was magic damage, anti-magic shell would technically be the strongest cooldown, since it would be mitigating all incoming damage, at least until the shield effect expires. Magic damage aside, Vampiric Blood is generally going to be your most effective defensive cooldown, followed by Dancing Rune Weapon, Icebound Fortitude, and Lichborn with the Hardened Bones Conduit. Swarming Mist can be one of our strongest defensive cooldowns on multiple target pulls, or it can be one of our weaker defensive cooldowns if we are only fighting a single target. 
RuneTap, on the other hand, is not something we actively want to prioritize at all if we can help it. The second rule of thumb is to prioritize situational cooldowns since their value is inconsistent. The first group of cooldowns that fall under this category are magic damage specific abilities like anti-magic shell and zone. Because magic damage to you and your group is not very common and both of these abilities have a relatively short cooldown. Even if the magic damage coming your way is not too significant, you may want to aggressively use both anti-magic shell and zone whenever you can get value out of them. In the case of anti-magic shell, if you know an avoidable source of magic damage is not going to break the shell, it might just be worth taking some avoidable damage with it to gain runic power as long as you have no other good uses for the ability in the next minute. The second group of cooldowns in this category are ones that increase initial threat generation, if threat is currently an issue for you. The two defensive cooldowns that have that increased threat generation are Dancing Rune Weapon and Swarming Mist. So, if you are starting a large pull where threat may be an issue, you may wish to use these cooldowns over other options. Other considerations include prioritizing Dancing Rune Weapon when you would maximize Bone Shield generation from Crimson Rune Weapon, prioritizing Anti-Magic Shell for debuff prevention, and prioritizing Icebound Fortitude or Lichborn for crowd control removal. This video reviewed individual defensive cooldown mechanics, things to consider on when to use defensive cooldowns, and reviewed how to prioritize which defensive cooldowns to use first. If this content was helpful to you, or if there are any additional topics you would like to see, leave a comment below or contact me through Discord. My information can be found in the video description below. In the meantime, good luck with your tanking and have fun!